We're going to turn this morning in God's Word to the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 23. And over the last couple of weeks, we've had kind of a sermon series of sorts on this issue of neighboring. How do we be a good neighbor? How do we reach out in Christ's name to those who live next door to us, across the block, across town, um, and ultimately around our world as well? And we've looked at a couple of different aspects of that over the last couple of weeks. What we want to see today is that part of being a good neighbor is the little things that happen every day, the little interactions that we have with the people around us. And we're going to hear about that this morning in Exodus chapter 23. Do not spread false reports. Do not help a wicked man by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. And do not show favoritism to a poor man in his lawsuit. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to take it to him. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, don't leave it there. Be sure you help him with it. Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Have nothing to do with a false charge and do not put an innocent or honest person to death, for I will not acquit the guilty. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds those who see and twists the words of the righteous. Do not oppress an alien. You yourselves know how it feels to be aliens because you were aliens in Egypt. For six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops, but during the seventh year let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it, and the wild animals may eat what they leave. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days do your work, but on the seventh day do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the slave born in your household, and the alien as well, may be refreshed. Be careful to do everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard. On your lips. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> well, friends of Jesus, one of the most interesting things about being somebody who spends a lot of time at this church building and then who lives right next door is that I get to see a lot of interesting things that happen in our parking lot outside. Some of you have been around enough that you, you know what some of those interesting things are. But just in case you don't, here's the kind of examples of some things that happen. Just this past week, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, I was going home for lunch and I was walking across the parking lot and and out there in the parking lot are four National Grid trucks, kind of parked in a row. And uh, one of the guys had his window rolled down, so I had said hi. And and turns out, get into this conversation, these guys are there on their lunch break. They've been working right up the street. In fact, somebody said later on, I think I saw them. They're working right up the street, and they wanted a place big enough to park their trucks where they'd be out of the way. And they chose our parking lot. There have been a couple of times where my kids have run excitedly to the windows because the Northbridge Fire Department is out there in the parking lot with their fire trucks. They have to test their equipment periodically, and, and there they are with a ladder going up and down and you know, swiveling stuff around, and, and it's quite the show, and if you ever have an opportunity to see it, it, it's, it's interesting to see what our, our firefighters have to do when they're not fighting fires, to be ready. Occasionally, we'll get a car carrier, and I'm not talking about one of those flatbed trucks that has one, one or two cars on it. We're talking about like those ones on the expressway that are going to take your cars from here to Detroit. You, you know, eight, nine, whatever they have on them. And, and once, in fact, the car that came off was the one in the very nose, and so they had to, like, back every single car out. So we had, like, a used car lot out there in our parking lot. And speaking of used car lots, I think we're on Craigslist or something like that. And, of course, I haven't even mentioned yet all the times that people are out there with their kids riding bikes. And I'll, I'll walk past the parent and, and we'll kind of smile at each other and, and they'll tell me, you know what, I learned to ride my bike here in this parking lot. And now years later, I get to bring my kid back to the same spot. Thank you. You know, when we look at the Bible's teaching about living alongside one another as neighbors, one of the things that we find is that living as a reflection of God's love is something that happens in thousands of ordinary, everyday encounters with those around us. 
Now, we don't always think of it that way. I think we know it intuitively. But when we think about showing God's love and being a good neighbor, we often think about the extraordinary Good Samaritan stories, the kinds of things that we read about last week. Here's this guy in the gutter, and I'm going to go save him. And certainly, we're called to do that. We're called to, you know, if God puts it, puts it on our heart to go to India like Mother Teresa and care for the poor there. But so often it's easy to say, look at that and say, well, you know what? God hasn't laid that on my heart. So, you know, if, if I ever have the opportunity to be a good neighbor like that, I will. Yet we see in the Bible and in our ordinary experience that a love for neighbor customarily works itself out in far more everyday ways. I may theoretically have a deep love for leprosy victims in India, but I never have to show it. But if I have to love the person across the street who's having a dance party with loud music at 11 o'clock at night, I have a pretty good opportunity to try to figure out what loving my neighbor looks like. And that's what this morning's text is showing us. Sometimes we have a tendency to skip over these kinds of texts in Scripture because either they seem so self-evident to us or they seem so confusing and out of touch with where we are today. And I think we can sense both of those things about what we just read. I mean, in some ways, it seems so very obvious that, of course, if we're called into a lawsuit, we have to tell the truth. And on the other end of the spectrum, I can't remember the last time that my neighbor knocked on my door and said, you know, my ox is wandering around. Can you help me find it? You know, I, that just doesn't happen here in White and Woods. And, and so we kind, of, we kind of go past things like this because it's, it's either way too easy or way too hard to apply. But if we slow down and ask, what is God doing here with his people in this text and with us? I think we'll see that God is showing us the kinds of practical everyday ways that a love for neighbor can reflect his love for us in Christ. Love for others shows up in things like the kinds of reports, the stories that we tell about our neighbors, or we tell to them. It shows up in the ways that we deal with the property of others. It shows up in our awareness of those who are vulnerable around us. It shows up in our patterns of work and rest. In short, it shows up in numerous ordinary encounters through which Christ's love is revealed. Well, what I want to do today is look briefly at three areas described in this passage to understand these verses better and then to understand how passages like this function for us. Old Testament law can function for us today. Now, they're not organized quite this neatly as as I make it sound. It's not like there's headings saying Roman numeral 1, A, B, C. But I I think you'll see that there is a logic to how these laws are grouped and and what's next to each other. So first we find a series of instructions in verses 1 through 3 about telling the truth. Now, most of us here are familiar with the ninth commandment, right? You shall not bear false testimony against your neighbor. You can go to Exodus 20 and read that exact command. And here what God is doing is really expanding that instruction with some examples about the kinds of situations in which truth is important. Redeemed people. In fact, God references that. You were in Egypt. You were slaves in Egypt, and now I've taken you out. You were slaves to sin, and now I've redeemed you in Christ. Redeemed people are not to spread false reports. And, of course, it goes on to talk about lawsuits and court cases and that sort of thing. But the, the initial statement makes it clear that it's not just court cases that God is interested in here. God applies this to any kind of report, any kind of a story that I pass along, whether it's something that I'm saying about my neighbor or to my neighbor. Whether it's about a government official or a policy, what I say to and about my wife or my kids. And it doesn't matter if everybody else believes the same report. It says we are not to follow the crowd in doing wrong. Don't just go along with a story because everybody else is telling the same story or everybody else thinks that this is funny, the funny kinds of things to report. In fact, God makes it clear that sometimes even when we're trying to do the right thing, in this case, help the poor, it's possible to do that in a way that is not truthful, that lacks integrity, that dishonors him. Truth is vital to being a good neighbor. The second area that we find described in these verses has to do with who we interact with, and that takes us from verse 4 down to about verse 9. Now, again, this this makes sense if you think about it. It's fairly easy, or at least it's a lot easier for us to care about those who we already who we or feel already sort of care about us, 
you know, the neighbor who takes good care of the lawn or, you know, the person who came over to, you know, to bring a, a cake when we moved in or something like that. But God here instructs us that we are to care for enemies as well. And when we hear the word enemy, we're not supposed to think, which we probably first of all do, enemy is that, you know, the secret government agent from North Korea who's slinking around somewhere on your, in your, you know, trying to read your internet settings or something like that. Now, that's not who God is talking about here. Certainly, we're called to love our enemy, even, even those kinds of enemies. But the enemies God is talking about here are far more ordinary kinds of enemies. He's talking about the guy at work who annoys you because he chews too loudly or talks in the phone too loudly in the next cubicle over. God is talking here about the kid in school whose popularity and probably arrogance annoys you because they can get away with whatever they want. God is talking about your sister who just ruined your Lego creation. Not that this ever happens. Or he's talking about a brother who grabs more than his fair share of the inheritance. Again, not that this ever happens, but it does. And what God says to his people is that we have a duty and a responsibility to protect even our enemies as much as we want to protect our friends. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't name the sins that others are committing against us. We can. We should. In the right setting. But the fact that others sin against us doesn't release us from honoring and caring for them. Nor, as these verses go on, nor does a person's social status free us from being a neighbor. A few verses ago, we were instructed not to be swayed unfairly out of sympathy for a person's situation, but also here we're told not to take advantage of our relative power in a situation. Don't take advantage of the vulnerable around us just to protect ourselves, to protect our own interests. And the poor and the alien are specifically mentioned here, those without the connections that we have. Now, again, we don't generally apply these verses today to the oxen wandering in the whitened woods. But the fact that God even mentions animals here, weighed down under their burdens, shows something of God's heart for all of creation. See, who we interact with, who we're willing to become neighbors to, says something about our view of the neighbors that God gives us and says something about our view of God and his attitude toward us. So we have false reports. We have something about wandering oxen and caring for others regardless of who they are. Third, we find some instructions about our use of our time and resources, our olive groves, so to speak. And this commandment, as we see in verse 13, kind of wrapping up this whole section, brings us right back to our worship of God. How we do these things says something about our view of who God is and what he wants us to be in relation to him. As one scholar puts it, the Sabbath, both the day and the year, was intended to bring restoration, refreshment, verse 12 has it, restoration and well-being for God's people, not merely a stopping of activity. God tells his people, in other words, not to put all their time and resources into what we'd call productive use. Now, this is absolutely crazy, especially for people who like to work hard and I think most of us in this church appreciate hard work. God says, slow down. Don't use everything. Don't invest it all. Set some of it aside. Now, how we do this today is going to differ from the agricultural society that Israel, that God is speaking to in Israel. We have to figure out how to how to make this make sense in a world that goes 24-7. But if you think about it, it's no less crazy in, in our day than in Israel's day. If you're in a subsistence agriculture mode, you need that field seven years in a row. You don't want to let it lie fallow every seventh year. God is teaching his people that our resources are not our own, that our time and our treasures need to be set aside for his use, that we can slow down and see the world as he sees it. And just as God directs the full force of his resources to caring for us, his creatures, again, here again, verses 11 and 12 mention the animal world, right? So God's people are are to recall that we are stewards of all that he has given us in order to care in his name for our neighbors and even for the whole creation. Time and resources, our time, our resources are to be directed 
not just to our building up, our security, but to our neighbor's welfare as well. Now, as we listen to all these rules, I want to let the full force of them sink in for a couple of minutes. I imagine that for most of us, we think if God really asked me to do something difficult and dangerous, if he made it clear, for example, that I'm supposed to go to China as a witness for him, or or that my witness to the faith is going to land me in prison, I'd be willing to do that. And hopefully, if God calls us to do those things, we will be ready when the time comes. But more often, we find that God doesn't ask for obedience in anything so grand. What he asks for obedience is in the daily, regular, routine little acts of faithfulness. And sometimes that's that much harder to give over to God. Because we're not just being asked to give one big, massive moment to God. We are asked to give him countless little, tiny moments of faithfulness and obedience. I thought of this earlier in the week. I was out running some errands, and I happened to overhear a conversation between two men who were walking by me. And they'd just finished talking to another guy, and the one said to the other, he said, so you're going on vacation this week? And he said, no, I'm not. He said, well, what do you mean? I thought I just heard you say you were going away. He goes, well, I am, but my wife and my kids are coming with me, and after that, I need another vacation to get away from them. And as I thought about that interaction, and I don't know, I just heard a little snippet of the conversation, so it's hard to know what was really going on in that conversation, but I thought that's the kind of thing that God is talking about here. Maybe it is a challenge or burden to go away with those you love. Maybe the relationships aren't what they're supposed to be. Or or maybe it's just the way that in this man's mind everybody talks about their family, that, yeah, you know, you've got to joke a little bit about, about being tied down by the obligations, but I thought this is the kind of report that God is talking about. What does that say about the wife, about the kids? about whether they're important, whether they're valued. See, God is talking here about what we pass along on social media. God is asking us to think here about what we tell the person who lives across the street or what we say about them to the person who lives on the other side. God is asking us to think about the attitude towards the families who happen to be in our parking lot or or maybe who ride down your sidewalk or in front of your house. God is asking how we can show his kindness to the guys in the national grid truck and thank them for their work rather than complaining when it takes a little longer than we'd like to get the power back on after a storm. God calls us to ask if we're willing to invest part of our summer break, our ordinary lives, part of our retirement, to invest in the children and the families and the people around us in community to hear their stories and to protect their welfare in the same way that we work to protect our economic status and our leisure time. God shares his kindness and joy with us. Paul writes this in Acts 14. God does this little ordinary moments. He sends rain on the crops and he sends sunshine and he makes food to grow and he gives us the joy of living in community and in families. And he calls us to do the same with each other in ordinary moments. See, the reason that God takes so much time, and if you go through the the rest of the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, we find all sorts of laws. And and there's been lots of work that's been done by commentators over time trying to catalog these. But, But the basic force of this is that what God does here is sort of unpack the Ten Commandments. He gives the Israel these basic ten instructions. And then he spends the next three books, four books of the Bible, unpacking what that means in everyday, ordinary situations, not all of which we recognize as easily as our situation, but all of them applied to little, ordinary, everyday things. And why does God do that? Well, it's because God is a God of the ordinary. God doesn't just create us for a few mountaintop spiritual moments with him. God creates us for fellowship with him, walking with him in the cool of the day. We see that picture in Genesis 3. Think about that. Being connected to God is as natural in every day as me walking across the parking lot to go spend time with my family after I get done with work. 
And this morning as we celebrate communion, I think there's something beautiful in the ordinariness of this picture of God's extraordinary love. I mean, we're celebrating here the death of the Son of God on the cross for the sin of the world. And how does God remind us of that? Well, he gives us little chunks of bread. And he tells us to pass around a cup, things that we do multiple times every day. And he says, this is how you'll remember. Extraordinary love is remembered in the little everyday ordinary acts through which we see God's kindness. And we see in this too that Jesus didn't just die for the big sins like murder or bank robbery. Yes, he died for those and if those are in our stories, we can bring them to him in repentance and grace and trust that they'll be forgiven too. But we see that Jesus died for the little everyday things like my tendency to walk through the parking lot without caring about the stories of the people unloading cars or teaching their kids to bike. He dies for the selfishness that we have, that I have, that ignores the needs of our neighbors, even sometimes the needs of a family member. He dies for a sense of entitlement over the privileges that I've been given, that I begin to believe that they are mine by right as opposed to be mine as a gift, as a trust. Jesus dies for countless ordinary ways that I don't love my neighbor as myself. As well as the ordinary ways my neighbor needs a savior as well. And what we see in all of this is exactly what we saw last week. As we thought about ourselves, you know, it's so tempting to want to be the good Samaritan instead of seeing that we need Jesus to be the one to pick us up and to care for our wounds and to bandage us and to pay the price so that we can be brought back to health. See, God shared his own son for our sake because he's glorified not just in our ability to manage the big stuff in life, but because he is, his saving grace is reflected in the ordinary, everyday stuff of life as well. The Apostle Paul in Romans 14 is talking about how we're, God is glorified and what we eat or drink. I mean, we're talking about little everyday stuff here, right? Now, not that it doesn't matter. You can read Romans 14 and see why Paul was getting into this discussion. But at the end of that, Paul says, none of us lives to himself alone and none of us dies to himself alone. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And it's for this very reason that Christ died and returned to life, that he may be the Lord of both the dead and the living. A couple of days ago, I happened to read a blog by another pastor. This pastor was reflecting on the ways in which so many things in life have just happened in sort of ordinary acts of service. And he said occasionally people will tell him with some embarrassment, he said, little deeds and routines they practice. And he, he talked about the, the man who takes a walk every morning and picks up the garbage along the road. He said, you know, there's a lot of garbage in this world, but at least this stretch of road is clear. He talked about a woman who, when she gets in the checkout line and there's the, the mother in front of her with, with kids screaming and, and you, know, ma, you can see this, this poor mother just wants to kind of pull out her hair. And she says, I always say a prayer, not that God would just make me patient, but that God would help her to be patient. And, and if there's an opportunity, you know, can, I, can I hold something? Can I push your cart? You know, to look for opportunities to be of service there. He talked about the woman who stops in the church kitchen every week or two to make sure that the aluminum foil hasn't run out and there's enough dish soap. And he said the beauty of it, so often we think about how God can see everything, including everything we've ever done wrong. He said the beauty of the gospel is that God takes little things like this and uses them to make everything right. Neighboring doesn't just mean rescuing people across the street when their house is on fire. Hopefully it means that. But neighboring begins with the reports that we give about them, the stories we tell about them. It begins with wandering oxen, with olive groves. It begins with car deals and kids on bikes in our parking lot. It begins where God begins with us, by walking together in the cool of the day or the heat of summer, inviting sinners to feast with him. It begins by realizing that we are the neighbors on whom God's mercy has been poured out in countless little ways. It 
and of course, in the one phenomenally huge gift of his son. And that realization of God's mercy to us calls us to go and do likewise, to be changed by the extraordinarily ordinary love of Christ for the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you loved us with a love that is both beyond comprehension, but a love which you made comprehensible in so many ways. Everyday mercies like air to breathe and water to drink, homes that shelter us from the elements, the joy of human love, of friendship, of family. Teach us how to love one another as you've loved us. And as we do that, use these small acts, even the smallest act, so that the mercy of Jesus Christ is on display. We pray this in the power of the Holy Spirit who transforms us and changes us. Amen.